I'm really happy um, and grateful to have this opportunity to share what I feel is really important right now. Um, music as an overlooked resource to heal and unify us, um, enhance our humanity. And so let us begin. I'm going to have three portions in my presentation today. First, I'll start with the good news. <laughs> music heals. I'll talk about some of the latest studies, what we know um, about how music enhances our well-being and how it works. What is music as opposed to, for example, noise, right? How does it work? And then I'll talk about not the bad news, but uh, food for thought. What we've been getting wrong. We have all this data now about how effective music is, but we've not been entirely successful in implementing this power or even actually recognizing it. Um, why is that? I'll talk about that. But most importantly, I want us all to think about what each of us can do. Okay. In, so let us start with the benefits of music. And I'd like to make this a poll question. So one of these is not entirely true. Which one? Oh, yes. Okay, most of you got it. Yes, okay, so let me go over each one of these. So does music help neonatal intensive care unit preemies, preterm babies? Yes, it does in so many different ways. So preterm babies are born not equipped to deal with a lot of things like feeding themselves yet, right? For, so they have problems sucking often the milk, but if you were to give them a little percussive music sounding like then they can suck better. It also regulates their breathing and calms their heartbeat down. Usually their breath are very, very shallow and very rapid, but listening to calm music like lullabies, um, their mother is singing their lullabies, um, calms their breath down on average, minus 3.91 breath per minute. It also helps the caretakers. It reduces the anxiety and stress level of the mothers, which transfers to the babies, helping everybody, right? Okay, dementia prevention. <laughs> Musicians are 64% less likely to develop dementia. Okay, this I have to talk about. So this was a nationwide study done in Sweden. And what they did was to take all the twins that were above the age of 65. And they took twins where one of the twins had um, dementia and the other one didn't. And they asked a whole bunch of questions about their lives, marriage, food preference, blah, blah, blah. And it turned out one of the differences was that one played, one without the dementia, um, played an in, uh, instrument for more than five years and pretty regularly still. But this ended up being a very, very small group of uh, twins, even in the nationwide study. So it was like, I think it was 153 pairs of twins. So it's still a very small group um, and this needs to be researched more, but still it kind of indicates that, you know, instrumental playing helps. And also there is also a study that if you'd studied instruments as a child for 10 years or longer, you're less likely to develop dementia. Now improves productivity, inconclusive, music does help with endurance right? Um, it decreases your pain perception. And uh, for example, if you're on a treadmill, you're more likely to run 20% longer um, than without music. Um, if you're a factory worker, do repetitive work all day long, music helps with your productivity. If you need to coordinate your movement with your peers, then music definitely helps. Music helps with a lot of things, but if your task was intellectual, if it required mental focus, then music can be a distraction because it takes up a lot of your cognitive capacity, right? It makes sense. It depends on what kind of music, it depends on the, the volume and it depends on all sorts of things. So this you cannot 
say entirely true. So it's incon inconclusive. Now, does music help the intubated patients in ICUs? Very pertinent right now. Yes, it does. It helps regulate their breath and heart rate kind of inconclusive blood pressure, but it's more likely that it reduces the blood pressure and it regulates the heart rate as well. Breathing, definitely, it regulates their breath. It calms it down, it makes it more steady. And, uh, and also all of these things contribute to, like on average, about 30% reduction on the sedative intake. And at the end, one study from 2018 concludes that it can save the hospital $2,322 on average per patient. It's a bit frustrating for a musician like myself because we have these studies and yet, um, you know, even though the ICUs are overflowing right now, are the musicians being called on to help um, and no, I'm on a list of volunteers who are willing to play via iPad for ICU patients. And how many times have I gotten the call since March? Three times, three times. Um, it's for a lot of things, a lot of reasons. Lack of iPads, lack of personnel to deliver the iPads to the patients, da -da 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 -da. The, all these logistical reasons. But I think the underlying problem is lack of awareness and also bias against music as a resource. And so I'd like to really share this information with you and everybody as much as I can and always grateful for the opportunity. Okay, let us move on. So why is music so effective? One of it has to do with our sense of hearing, how it works. So hearing is 20 to 100 times faster than vision. Yes, light is faster than sound, but once the image hits our eyes, the amount of time it takes for our brain to process the image is much, much slower than the sound that hits our eardrums and then gets processed in our brain. Why is that? It's because the brain wiring is so much more simple for the, our sense of hearing. It basically skips the prefrontal cortex, the most developed part of our brain that has to do with things like logic and reason. So when we have an image hit our eyes, we actually think about the image, but when there is a sound, we turn to the sound without thinking. If it was a life-threatening sound, we start running or we start fighting before we can think about it, right? This has to do with our survival instinct, of course, it goes directly to the part of our brain called amygdala, which is a very sort of primitive part of our brain. It has to do with things like appetite, um, sex, right, uh, sexual urges, right, reproductive urges, um, and survival instinct. And so it has to be processed quickly. Eyes close, we shut our eyes, we blink, we go to sleep, we shut our eyes, but our ears are always alert because it's the sense that's most likely to save our lives. And because sound goes directly to amygdala, instead of going through the prefrontal cortex, it goes directly to our hearts per se, you know, like it, it goes more directly to our emotions. And that's why, for example, for dementia patients, when they lose the ability to speak, you can often sing to them with lyrics and they can sing with you. Music is like that, music is that powerful. So let's talk about music. Um, what is music as opposed to noise? Music is a sound with patterns that we are familiar with and when, when our expectation is defied, we find it amusing. I think that's music, right? So if it's like a very steady pattern sound, it, it's, it gets boring. Like metronome sound, you don't find musical, right? But if there is a slight variation, 
ah, you know? And also, so music is set to consist of three components, rhythm, melody, and harmony. And different parts of the music um, speaks to our brains in different ways. Rhythm synchronizes our biorhythms. So like I said about the preemie babies and patients on in, um, ventilators, it regulates our heartbeats, it regulates our breathing. It also, our brain waves start synchronizing when we listen to music communally. And we find this very, very bonding and reassuring as a social animal. Music also stimulates the motor cortex, the part of our brain that has to do with motion. So even if we are completely still as we listen to music, the part of our brain that has to do with motion is actually ignited as though we are moving a little bit. And we can use this part of the music this way. So this is Mark. He has a spinal uh, cord injury, so he can only walk this way. But on the same day, same shirt, same shoes, same day with music, It works the same way with Parkinson patients and stroke patients. Um, it, music is very effective this way in physical therapy. That's only one example, but in the interest of time, let us move on to melody. A melody, simply put, is just a pitch inflection and it reflects our vocal inflections, right? So when we get excited, our voice goes up, Right? And then when we are calmer or when we are tired or sad, our voice goes slower. And that's universal. Before we start speaking, we recognize this. And even after we lose the ability to talk, brain injury or dementia, you can still use your vocal inflection this way. And you know, in this day and age, um, when many of our communications are via digitized means like emails, not even handwriting, right? We tend to forget to listen to each other's voices and not just the words. So let us listen to this recording to remind ourselves the importance of vocal inflections. Aho? 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 Oh. Oh. Mm. <laughs> I love this recording. <laughs> Harmony. So let me talk about Pythagoras. <laughs> it was Pythagoras, actually, there are lots of legends about Pythagoras, but you know, he's so old, we actually have very little records. So we don't know if it actually happened, but we think, we say that he's someone that discovered that, so what you're seeing right now, the top is the sound wave, right? And then one lower is twice as fast sound frequency, which is this note. And then, so this is two to one, right? And then below that is two to three, this note. And then below that, three to four. And then, so basically Pythagoras discovered that musical consonances can be described in very simple numerical ratios. And because of this, he thought that music was the embodiment of universal truth. And he worshiped numbers and he worshiped music for this reason. And, and there is this ancient Greek thought called harmony of the spheres. So the ancient Greeks considered everything that has motion to have sound. And so, you know, stars are moving, so they must be making some kind of a sound, right? 
but this is a sound that is consistent from the moment of our birth to the moment of our death. So we cannot hear it. It's such a given to us. It's like air. We cannot see it, but it's there. And good music is the one that resonates with this harmony of the spheres. And also he thought that because our body has motions, our internal organs are moving, right? It's also making sound and we are healthy when the, the music of our body is in resonance with the music of the universe. Harmony of the spheres, silence. So we are bombarded with sound and music today and we forget the importance of sound. And now with all these research going on uh, with the, the benefit of music, we are also discovering the importance of silence. So there was a study. Um, they had the subjects listen to classical symphonies. And what they wanted to know was when our brain is the most active. So is it at the beginning of the piece? Is it when the piece is at the loudest, the quietest, at the end of the piece? And it turned out that our brain was most active in between movements, in between the first and the second movement when there is a pause, because it turns out that when the music is going on, our brain is so busy receiving the, the input that it starts working like crazy when the music finishes to process what you just heard, right? Um, and there's another study, this one with mice. And so what they did was they wanted to see if the brain cells regenerate uh, more with the music going on. And so they had the mice listen to different kinds of music and they had the control group mice that didn't listen to anything. It was just silent. And it turned out that the mice in silent had cells in their gray matter, a part of our brain, um, just grow <laughs> more. And from these studies, we're now realizing how important silence is and also how precious silence is today. Um, if you have two minutes in your day, it's much better for you to listen to silence or sit yourself in silence than to listen to the so-called relaxing music in terms of reduction of the stress hormone, the cortisol, um, and blood pressure, especially in your brain, uh, things like this. And so if you only have two minutes, don't listen to music, but listen to silence. I propose that one of the reasons why we have been consistently failing, I say failing, um, to utilize the power of music, even though we have all these studies now, is because the currently dominating musical aesthetic is based on that of Western classical music. But Western classical music is more an exception than a rule. When we look at music as a universally human practice, we must realize this in order to harness the power of music. And let me talk about this a little more. So this is the very, very beginning of notation. The history of Western classical music starts with Gregorian chant. And it started with the idea that Catholic liturgy had to be standardized throughout the entire Christendom, right? And so they wanted to make all the liturgical music exactly the same, whether you were in Northern France or Germany or wherever you were, Italy, wherever you were, no local flavors. Liturgical chant had to be sung exactly the same way everywhere, right? And other civilizations have attempted coming up with notations, but until Western classical music achieved it, it was always a memory aid 
right? It was always in memory. So unless you'd heard the piece before, unless you basically know how the tune goes, you couldn't have read the music and recreated it. But Western classical music achieved this. And so it made it very special. So first of all, notation was developed in order to propagate specific music and ideas and culture. And it separated, it had the effect of separating worthy music from not so worthy music. So for the longest time, notated music was the religious music and secular music were not as worthy, not worthy of recording, right? And then, um, and it also allowed for a very rapid development of a very, very complicated musical styles. And this idea of inaudible music. So until notation, music only existed when it was being performed. Now, because we have a form of music um, that doesn't depend on a performance, it can exist outside of space and time, right? Okay, let me move on. Okay, I wonder if you can tell what this is. And now I'm talking about music. That is my area of expertise, but you can replace the word music with the word idea and pretty much the same thing. This is printing press. So Gutenberg's printing press was invented in 1440. The first music to be printed by printing press was on 1501. What it did was the commodification of music and very, very wide dissemination of sa the same music across borders, across cultures, right? And again, the separation of worthy music and not worthy music, right? Okay. And then this, this is the phonograph, blueprint to the phonograph invented by Edison. Actually, that's arguable, but anyways, uh, this is Edison's patent. So what did this do? So like the notation, but actually this time, not the idea of music, but the performance itself was now placed outside of time and space. And it allowed for music as a solitary act. So until then, and also when we look at music as a global phenomenon throughout our human history, music is usually participatory and communal, right? At least the musician and the listener has to be sharing the space and time. Now, with the invention of phonograph, this is no longer true. Music can be a solitary act. And invisible musicians, this completely disembodies music. So, you know, there is Walkman, and then, you know, now there is downstreaming, blah, 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 all these things. Music, like I said earlier, synchronizes our heartbeat and breathing and brain waves and our emotions, right? And it helps us remember that what we share is greater than our differences. But, you know, when music becomes a wall to the rest of the world, what is it doing to our idea of humanity and music. And I wonder if this is what, not one of the reasons why we fail to recognize music as a resource. Okay, so there are other things that made music more disembodied. In 1700, around 1700, the idea of fine art was established and music became one of its branches. Fine art is defined as arts purely in pursuit of the ideal of beauty with no practical purposes, right? So it cannot be for utility. I think we feel guilty when we think about music as something useful, like music therapy. I think it comes from this idea, fine arts. And then 
aesthetic as a branch of philosophy was established in 1735, beauty as philosophy. So perception is now entwined with reason. And Kant, in his critique of pure reason, said that there was a gap between the world as we perceive it and the actual true reality. And our life's goal is to transcend this gap somehow. And post-Kantian philosophers came up with all sorts of ways to possibly transcend this gap. Um, some said religion, some said uh, death. And Schopenhauer most famously said, passive immersion in abstract beauty was the most effective gateway to transcend this gap um, to the true reality, objective true reality in his world as will and representation. And what could be more abstract than instrumental music without lyrics? So like sonatas, symphonies, things like that, right? And so these things, led to the audience, the consumers, whose only participation was expected to be in passive admiration, right? Um, they were overwhelmed. They didn't know what to do. And so program notes, you know, that talks about what the music is about and all these started around this time. Also, there were people you could hire to clap and say bravo and things like this um, if you were the presenter or the composer, right? Um, they needed to be told if the music was good or not because people were starting to feel overwhelmed and insecure. <laughs> and so ritualized concerts and passive audience. Now, isn't this, doesn't this remind us of something? <laughs> So given all this, what can we do? And I will make some very theoretical suggestions, but I'd like you to think about what can you do? Maybe it's to start the piano lessons that you've been meaning to start a long, long time ago, or maybe to go back to that LP um, that's been collecting dust, or maybe you want to start composing again. Maybe you want to sing as families again, like you used to in our daily lives. Think of music as an embodied practice to enhance your well being, to optimize your executive function. So, you know, really being engaged with music can increase your focus, increase your, your memory capacity. It can also increase your emotional control. Um, it can organize your life better, things like this. Music helps you savor the here and now. Okay, it, think of listening as a mindful practice. And in our relationships, music as a bonding ritual. And when, we, when I say music, it doesn't have to be the whole entire symphony. It could be just a very little bitty short like cues, you know, um, like, like, a, like a bell sound or like a, anything, you know. Think of music as something that's more valuable when you share it, like laughing, meals, and exercise. When you laugh together, it's even funnier. When you share a meal, it's even tastier. Music is like that too. Okay, and music can be a reminder that what we share is greater than our differences. Very pertinent right now, I think. And in our society, what can I do better as a musician and re researcher to promote this? If you have any idea, I'd love to brainstorm with you. Music as a resource. Music encourages empathy. Empathy requires courage. It's, it's, it takes courage to empathize with somebody who is suffering, but music, music helps us do this. And music is inexpens inexpensive and accessible. So compared to medicine, one doctor can see one patient at a time, but music, no problem. After, let's, let's think about like after a natural disaster, so many people, if you can just play music for them at once, just change the perception of their pain, for example. 
And I think it can help restore our faith in humanity. Music can teach us to be more holistic. And I hope, I hope my presentation um, can start us thinking about this. It can help us value our sensory experience more. It can encourage us to take our time to feel better. It reminds you that we are more than our thoughts. Each of us is a part of a whole. Each of us is like a note in a beautiful piece of music. And let's do our part. How can we do our parts better? So this concludes my presentation.